we're going to start with the part two. So given this background, uh, you know, I covered very quickly, but as I said that you can, there are lots of resources you can spend some time to understand deeper. Uh, <clears throat> given this background, we're going to talk about uh, the recent work we have done using the deep learning. So some of these problems are similar as I talk, talked about in the second lecture using classical computer vision techniques, and but we are using now deep learning. So um, there are eight different papers. These papers we published either last year or this year. So these are very recent papers. And <coughs> there are two major, uh, maybe three major conferences in computer vision. One is most prestigious called ICCV, International Council of Computer Vision. Other is called CVPR, which is Computer Vision Pattern Recognition Conference. Um, that will be held next month in Salt Lake City. And uh, ICC was held last year in October in Venice. And third major conference is ECCV, European Conference of Computer Vision, which will be held in September in Munich, Germany. So <coughs> I'm going to talk about the works we have published in CVPR in ICCV. So I'm going to talk about this paper on semantic segmentation, which we published in ICCV last year. And um, second work is given an image, we want to find the facial attributes of a face. This uh, we published last year in CVPR. And third work is we want to re-identify a person and it's called human re-identification. This will present next month in CVPR. And the fourth topic is the given a drone video, we want to detect the targets like vehicles. <coughs> then I'll talk about a method we have for detecting anomaly in a video when there's something unusual happen. This will also in CVPR. And then we move on to ICCV paper where we will recognize action and localize actions. And uh, <clears throat> next one will be, we'll use a language and also video to give in a video clip and a sentence with the one word missing, we will find that missing word. That's why we call video fill in the blank. And then we'll end talking about uh, how we can read the mind. So we'll put um, the EEG on a person's head and record these activations and we relate that to visual information. Okay? So let's get started. With the so this paper is available here and this there's a YouTube for this also on our channel, CRCV UCF channel. So that's a detailed presentation you can look at, about 18 minutes long. Okay, so this semantic segmentation deals with assigning a semantic label to each pixel in an image. Let's say we have these images, and these are different classes, building, car, crossroad, you know, field, cross, and so on. So given these images, we want to come up with images like this by a computer, okay? And um, so, the and we are going to use the you know deep learning so all these methods will be using deep learning so we have these images and somebody has sat down and labeled these images so this is the uh, grass this is a cat this is a bicycle something like that. So it's, a, it's called annotations we have annotated each pixel it's a lot of work so it's called label data and then we can put a label data and put these different layers and then we can come up with the output. So it's very similar. In the previous case, we were given an image. We were just saying is a bird, a sunset, and so on. Here we are going to classify each pixel. That it, if this pixel is a um, car, a building, a cross, and so on. So the same problem. Okay. So pixel levels compared to whole image level. The problem is that we don't have a lot of data because this requires lots of work 
because there are millions of pixels in each image to label these. And it's easy to label an image, you say, well, there's a bird, but it's very hard to label each pixel. So therefore, what we are going to do is leverage a lot of unlabeled data, because there are lots of images on the internet, and we want to use those, okay? And also, we will leverage some of the synthetic images, okay? So, we will have the label data, unlabeled data, and synthetic or generated images, and we will solve this problem in the semi-supervised fashion. So, because when you don't have a label, then it's not fully supervised. When we have label, if you use only these data, then it's called fully supervised. Because we have an image, we know this pixel should be this, this pixel should be this supervision. So that's the first step we do in uh, deep learning supervised, and that's first learning system is going to learn. It's come up with the filters so that it gives you the right right output, but we don't have enough data. So we will use the unlabeled data and generated data to learn this in semi-supervised learning, which means we'll have some labeled data, but other one will not be labeled. Okay. So we are going to um, so in semi-supervised learning is halfway between supervised and unsupervised. And uh, we are going to use this assumption that data points lying in the same feature space are more expected to be classified in the same class. If their features are similar, distribution of their similar, then they should belong to the same class, even though we don't have a label. So we will leverage unlabeled data to find this structure and the cost function will be for the semester learning will be this is a standard loss we have x and for which we have a label ground truth we want to minimize this but for the semi supervised learning we don't have a label we just have x so we'll minimize this loss and that will be a summation of two losses okay so now we are going to use this uh, very interesting idea what is called gain a generative adversarial network, which is a big uh, uh, revolution in deep learning. And this was designed uh, by Ian Goodfellow, who wrote this book on deep learning, a very young guy in a cafe in Montreal uh, on a you know, napkin, and he went home and programmed it works, and then it started the whole, whole field of this game. Um, so, so that will enable us to tackle this unsupervised learning. So intuitive idea is that we have a painter who wants to do art forgery. Uh, <clears throat> and let's say he wants to paint the Picasso painting. And we'll call that person, the painter G, is a generator. OK? Then we have a judge. Um, who is judging the paintings, and we we'll call D a discriminator. So then G produces paintings in an attempt to fool D, and D starts learning about Picasso. G has a harder time fooling D. Okay, so D gets really good in telling apart what is Picasso, what is not, because that D has access to real Picasso also. And then G gets really good at forging the Picasso paintings. So they will play this game and they will try to become smart. So, so the way it works that we can have this discriminator, a judge, it has access to real images. This is a generator, input to that will be a noise. From noise it's going to generate some image, the poverty image. And discriminator is going to distinguish. You say, well, this is a fake, this is a fake. But then, based on this feedback, this will learn better. Again, the learning means we'll have weights here. There are different layers. The different layers will keep updating the layers so that this loss function will be minimized so that discriminator will become better and generator will become better. So, so there are many, many papers these days on the game, and it generated lots of images, and they look very real. So now semi-supervised learning using games, the way we are going to use is that one is that we have 
uh, image and this is a ground truth. These are all pixels belong to this. And we have label data. We can train this, this network to come up with the output. So we have, say, k different labels. So it will come up with k, k images. So this will be all the pixels belong to the first class, will be ones, other will be zero, the second class, and the classes can be outdoor, can be building, and so on, so like that. And there'll be one map here, which will be a fake. So that pixel will be labeled fake, okay? So if it is the uh, fake image, then all the pixel in that will be, should be labeled fake. So this is the, um, the label data. Then we will have unlabeled data, which won't have a label, but will be from same distribution. Then we will have third data, which will be from generator, which will input be noise and generate data. So we will use these three uh, sources of data to learn the discriminator generator. And um, so the details are given <coughs> in that presentation. I gave the link. Uh, but let me show you th what we can do the results. So these are the images, and this is a ground truth. So we want to come up with a method where we can compare what is the uh, network is predicting, what is the ground truth, so we can say how well we are doing. And this is the fully supervised, and this is the semi-supervised. So as you see, we improve. This is better than this, and again, this is better, this is a better, bus here and so on, so which is good. So this is the quantitative results. So we can compare fully supervised. And there are different metrics, the pixel accuracy, mean accuracy, and so on. And we can improve you know, about 5% here. And in this one also, we can improve several percentages using this. This is another example, another data set. Um, images are like this. This is a ground truth, and this is a, the supervised data. And here we are using only 30% of supervised data. Now when we add semi-supervised, we can improve results, uh, which is much better compared to the fully supervised. As you see, we have less errors compared to the ground truth. So this is the first problem of semantic segmentation where we are assigning a label to each pixel. And uh, this is a one important problem because if you can understand each pixel in the image, you are done. You know, that's a standard computer vision problem. And the, the detailed presentation is given on YouTube. And um, this is a paper. So this is one of my PhD students graduated uh, last December. So let's go to the second one. Now here, we want to come up with the facial attributes. So we want to predict the attributes, like we want to say you know, attributes are eyeglasses and uh, bangs and uh, uh, wearing hat, baby hair, oval face, and so on. So these are the attributes, and there are total 40 attributes, you know, like this. It's a list of total attributes. So, so the idea is that we want to in this problem, we want to exploit the semantic segmentation of face, okay? So suppose if this is a face, then this first one is the background, then this is the hair, then this is a face, this is the eyes, eyebrows, and mouth, and nose, and so on. So there are different parts of the face, and that will help us to come up with the face attributes. So these are different examples of this. So our idea is that, you know, we want to uh, compute the attributes that are added to the object and they don't appear arbitrary in different regions. Um, and um, we want to decompose especially objects in semantic regions and then learn these attributes per region fashion. And uh, then we want to output these scores you know, for the each attribute and where they are inferred, because this would be more interesting. The main idea is that, remember that we are doing the pooling, we are looking at two by two and replacing by one value. That's called max pooling. 
So in, because mixed pooling, what it does, that it just, you know, go through and just, you know, get the maximum value from these each other. It doesn't have any sense of this region, say, belong to the hair, or this region belong to mouth, so it will mess up this pooling. So instead of what we do, that we do the pooling based on the semantic segmentation. So we want to pool the, all the pixels correspond to mouth together, all the pixels correspond to eyebrows together, separately, and so on. So that's the main idea. It's pretty simple. So here we get the features and we get the semantic segmentation of face, and then we go through the ReLU and all this thing, pool it, so, and make, makes a big difference. So there's a data set called Celebrity Data Set, and there are about 160 images. And um, these are some of the uh, you know, examples, and there are total 40 attributes. So now this is evaluated looking at the error, and we get um, from 18 to 10% to 8%, and this is a pretty the best result so far in this data set. More interesting thing is that if you look at these different semantic segments and different attributes, uh, we get some meaningful results. So let's look at this one, that if we look at attributes black hair, brown hair, and wavy hair, then the hair, which is shown blue here, have the highest contribution to decide these attributes, and which is meaningful, which is what we expect. Similarly, if you look at the, these attributes, where the mouth is important, which is shown red, goatee, uh, smiling, and this one, uh, mustache, then the red one has a higher value. So semantic segmentation are helping us to do the right decision. So um, the, as I said, the pooling, when you do the max pooling, so the response is like, like this, which means it's not focused particular region, similarly like this all over. But when you do our semantic segmentation pooling, then response more focused on the eyes, somewhere mouth, and so on, as you see, which is meaningful. So these are the qualitative results. So we picked some of these top attributes, you know, like attractive, black hair, brown hair, and so on. And uh, so these are the numbers. These numbers are between zero and one. And I think you will agree that they make sense. Do you know some of these guys? They are very famous. <laughs> they are actors, so like that. Okay? So this is how to find, given a face image, find attributes of that. That's an you know, interesting problem uh, using deep learning. So this is a paper, and we will have next week this student, PhD student who is here, sitting in the front row. He will make a presentation about that detail, so you can ask him questions and so on. Okay, so, and this was presented last CVPR. So the third topic is that we want to talk about is human re-identification. So here the problem is that given image of a person, we want to retrieve the similar image of the same person from a gallery. We have a the storage, we have uh, lots of images, we want to say, can you re-identify the same person? Um, so query and gallery images can be captured from different cameras, and uh, so it's a cross-camera data association problem. So this is a query, and the output can be like this. And we say that these are the retrieve images from the gallery, and they are ranked. This is the best match, this is the last best match, and when you look at the ground truth, that these are actually wrong, and these are correct. But the problem is that this is a very difficult problem because the viewpoint can change, and um, therefore we have to deal with these challenges. So one is the elimination conditions. It may be, you know, not same with different cameras. Other can be, you know, observably human body parts. Like here, some persons, you know, using umbrella so we are not it's not visible in this one um, the posture is different 
in this one uh, there is a background clutter. So in this one occlusion is occluded by tree. So it is not easy problem to solve. So what we are going to do again here that we are going to use the some body part information to help us retrieve these images. So one can simple can be we can find the different body parts like human pose estimation I told you before. <clears throat> find the joints you know the the head and the left shoulder, right shoulder, knee and so on. Uh, <clears throat> but these images are low resolution so therefore they they don't work with um, the body pose and other will be said we'll just take different parts of the image and stripes people have tried that but they don't provide any meaningful information about the semantic alignment so therefore what we are going to do we'll apply again the semantic segmentation of a whole body okay and um, then we'll train this system on multiple data set uh, to identify different people and use those features to train network solve the identification problem. So what we have is this is a network. So first thing we are going to do, take an image, compute these different features using these um, different layers and um, we will come up with this 2048 dimensional feature vector for this because we have training examples. We'll say, you know, this person should be person number three and we'll learn those weights of these and we'll take the feature vector before the fully connected layer. So that is one. Second thing is that we are going to take the image and do semantic segmentation and we'll have five different semantic segmentation. Uh, which will be the foreground, head, lower body, upper body and shoes. And we will then group them, one will be foreground, other will be the remaining four body parts. So in this way now we will have these three representation. Global representation, global pooling, other will be foreground representation, third will be body part representation. So we will concatenate this, put all these three vectors together and then use them. So, and it gives very good results. So, we have these three data sets for this problem, and uh, then this data set for the cement segment person. Um, so, given these images, then we are going to come up with these kind of results where we have shoes, uh, head, lower body, upper body, and so on. And this is another person and these are the semantic segmentation. Now the result for re-identification are shown here. So this is the query image and uh, if you use the simple neural network like Inception 3 then you will get these results. These first two are correct but these are three are wrong, this is wrong and then this is what we are going to use do because we are using semantic segmentation we improve this. This is another example is again very complex case. This will be the not using our method. This is what we can use and we have all correct and more examples. You know, here we do a couple of mistakes and so on. Here we do one mistake. So this is one <coughs> data set. There is another data set called market. Again similar phenomena we can improve, we can get all correct one here. We have one less, the ranking of incorrect one is higher, so which is good. And um, <clears throat> like this here we have all correct one and like that. So we have third data set Duke and uh, like that here we can get all correct ones and so on. <clears throat> so we can look at the numerical values you know, so this is a very active active area and there are many methods I proposed. So this is the best method, 60% and we can just do several data sets, <coughs> training, lots of training because neural network needs a lot of training. More examples you have better will become. So we can improve that but when we add the semantic segmentation we can go up to 84 which is a huge 
huge improvement compared to the 60 and so on. They are different you know, performance. So this is a paper we'll present in CEPR <coughs> next month. And again, the graduate student, he will make a presentation about this work uh, next week here, and you can ask him more questions. Okay, so then let's go to the next problem. And here we are going to look at the drone videos. So let's see like this one. So this uh, taking um, the video from 7,000 feet above the sea level. And there are many cameras uh, stood together. And these are actually the targets, vehicles. There are cars moving on the road. So we want to detect those automatically using neural network. Okay, this is again paper we are going to present in CVPR next month, and this student will make a presentation also next week. So um, now this is a data set from Wright Patrick Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio and uh, this covers around Ohio State campus, about 20 kilometers, square kilometers. <coughs> and uh, the vehicle is very small. Here, each vehicle is about 9 by 18 pixels. And about, um, there are about 2.4 million vehicles in this data set. So each frame may have 2,000 vehicles, OK? So uh, first thing is because this image is so huge, we cannot put this image in a GPU. GPU doesn't have enough memory. So we divide this image into these small chips, and then we put uh, these chips to the neural network. So the idea here is that we have these vehicles, and this is a ground truth. So somebody have sat down and say, this is a vehicle, this vehicle, this vehicle. We have shown why. So what we do is uh, so we'll take this image and um, this piece of it, these are the vehicles, and those are the points, and we apply Gaussian filter to that to smooth it. Instead of point, you now we have a little bullet image for each vehicle, just like this. And this we call a heat map. So we want to come up with this output from the neural network, OK? so. So now, since it's very difficult to detect vehicle in a single image, um, because there are so many, they are so tiny, so we use the video, we use five frames. So because the five frames will provide a motion information, and that will help us. So input will be five frames, and we want to take the vehicles in the center frame, two frames before, two frames after. And this will be the different layers, as you know. And this is a different filter size. And then output will be the heat map. So we have training. We have input like this, output like this. And we learn these filters, and we train them. OK? So now, because of the pooling, so the receptive field actually increases. It's a 15 by 15. But when you do pooling the next layer, even though it is, uh, it is 13 by 13, but that becomes actually 30 by 30. So when you go through different layers, the effective receptive field, when you apply this, becomes 72 by 72. So we're looking many more vehicles at the end. And um, so we get uh, very good results. So here we are going to show you the, the the yellow with the circle is we are detecting. The green ones are we are not detecting. And uh, this is, uh, these are the results, the recall and precision. That's a metric for computing. And the higher, the better. So these are different methods. And this is where we are. We can do much, much better, about 15% or so better. Um, then we have other area, this is called area of interest. Again, we can do very good, you know, much better than these other methods. Um, more results here. See, we are almost one. Um, and this shows you that if you use only one frame, 
then the results will be like this. Many of these you will miss, green ones are missing. But when you use multiple frame, use the motion information, you can do pretty good. So if you look at the numbers, we can get about 94 for this area. Now all these are very good methods, good results compared to all other methods. So this is the state of art, you know, we'll present this in CVPR and also you'll hear the detailed presentation next week. Okay, so then the next one, we're going to talk about how we can detect anomaly. This is also we'll present in CVPR and uh, so the idea here is that, uh, as you know, there are so many cameras everywhere, you know, the, in the city, in the theaters, in airport, and so on. There's so much video going on, but it's very difficult that people watch those videos. Uh, most of them, there's nothing happens, you know, the video is there, but, you know, people cannot do that. So what we want to do that automatically we want to scan the videos and identify if there's anomaly because most of the time in these videos there nothing happens, they are safe, but sometime there's anomaly and that's where we want to tell the monitor that will pay attention. So <coughs> that is called anomaly and um, now we want signal activity that deviates from normal patrons, and now it's very difficult to define what is anomalous, okay? This can be traffic accidents, crimes, or illegal activities, and, um, but they occur rarely, okay? So, so our approach is that we want land anomalies by exploiting both normal and anomalous videos. But we want to avoid the annotations because see the first we don't know what is anomalous what is not other is then you have long videos um, maybe there's no anomaly there's another long video maybe there's one anomaly so if one has to go through all those and actually uh, annotate which is a lot of work and uh, so we are going to use what is called the multiple instance ranking and um, but we will use the weekly label videos, okay? So we'll have video, long video, and, you know, we got from police department will say there's no anomaly, no anomaly, so many videos. But some videos they say there was anomaly, but they don't tell us where it is, okay? So the system automatically learns from it, and next time it will detect anomaly. So, um, so the idea is very simple. So we want to learn a function f so that for the um, the anomaly for the anomaly the value of function should be high and uh, for the video which is normal should be low. Okay. So this is a function we want to learn from these videos and. Um, so what we will have, we will have, we'll take a video and divide it in different pieces. And for each piece, uh, we will find the function. And uh, we want to make it that maximum value for, from among all these abnormal pieces should be higher than maximum value of all the normal pieces. We want to put this constraint, okay? And um, so this you can write, rewrite like this. And this is our last function. As we talk about neural network, you need to know last function. So here is the last function, okay? So therefore, neural network will be like this. So we have a video, we divide in these clips. You know, there are these segments. <coughs> Each is the 32 uh, frame segment. And this is the normal video. Again, we divide in these segments. So this will become one bag, which has these, the abnormal videos. This will become another bag, which is the, um, the normal videos. This is a positive bag because we want to identify ab abnormal video. 
and this is a negative back. Okay? So then we'll compute these features, you know, convolutional features, as we talk about different layers. These are convolutional layers, these are fully connected layers, and so on. And uh, then we will come up with the output of this. So it will assign a score to each of these bag here. And uh, <clears throat> these scores should satisfy that constraint we have in the loss function. And at the end, we will have the ranking loss, which will rank these videos and assign high value to the anomalous and low value to the normal video. So we have these 2,000 videos, and these are the kind of anomalies, and these are normal videos. Um, so these are the kind of results we get. So this is a function we have learned. So automatically, uh, <coughs> the system is able to come up with the function when there's uh, some anomaly, like here you saw it, be high value, OK? Um, so this would be explosion, again, will become high value. This is road accident. The shooting. This is a normal video. We are just playing fast, but it's a normal store. People are just, you know, shopping and so on. So now, in this one, another problem can be that actually we want to recognize these different categories of the anomaly. You know, as I showed you, there are several categories, and that performance right now is pretty low. So we can do only about, you know, less than 30 percent. So this is one project we will hear next week, uh, a week from next week, that if anyone is interested, because we have a data set, then some one of you guys can work on that. Right now, this is the performance, which is pretty low. And these are the uh, different anomalies we want to recognize. We want to recognize uh, <coughs> which anomaly it is. Now, previously, we say it's anomaly or anomaly, not normal. OK, so this is a more finer analysis. So this is about anomaly. So let's look at the next thing, which is about the action recognition. And this was a ICCV paper. And this is the YouTube presentation we have, if you want to look at that. And so idea here is that we are given the videos, and um, we want to put a label to that. Say, well, this is a biking, this is a tennis swing, this is a long jump, and so on. So the similar classification problem, but now we have video instead of single image, as we have been hearing about. <coughs> so the second problem in this is that we want to detect the action. We want to put a bounding box, and we want to say this is the diving action. Okay. Now there's a different version that can be untrimmed video where we want to <clears throat> do the special temporal localization. So it's here, sometimes action doesn't happen. So as soon as action happens, we want to put a bonding box. So the, <clears throat> the, the action is tennis, and the green is the ground truth, and the red is what we are detecting. So the other version will be that we can do semantic segmentation we can have pixel-wise segmentation. Say this is that particular action, and these are the pixels, which is more finer. It's a golf thing. So we have this uh, method. So this extension of CNN to 3D. So because there's filters you learn, those were image filters. Just we are applying 2D filters, 3 by 3 or 5 by 4. Now we will have 3D filters, because we'll apply each filter to the, each image. So you have 16 images, we have 16 filters like that. So, but the idea is similar, that we take a video, divide into these, we get these tubes, and we link the tubes, and then we do the pooling, and we can recognize actions, and also find the localization. So, same thing, you know, different layers, but the convolution is 3D, okay? 
Um, so these are the kind of results we can get, and these are very good results. So red is the our detection, and the ground truth is green. As you see, there are very tighter bounding boxes. And this is another data set. Again, we can do pretty good. And these are the numbers, uh, metrics that you know we improve quite significantly on these data set. <clears throat> and this is the actual segmentation, the pixel by segmentation, which is much finer as compared to bounding box um, on the UCF sports. Because the bounding box contains a lot of background, but actor is actually only green. <coughs> okay, so now next thing we are going to talk about that how we can combine the language and the vision. Okay, so what's the problem? So we're given a video clip like this and a sentence which says he blank up the steps of staying and away. So there's one word missing and we want to output that missing word and that missing word are, is runs he runs up the steps of the stand away and there can be multiple blanks it can be he runs up the steps of the stand and away so what we do that we have two input now we have a sentence incomplete sentence and video so again we find the features or what is called encoding of this video encoding sentence coding and then we combine and find the missing word so like this is a video then we divide this sentence in two parts one on the left of the blank and one on the right of the blank okay and we use this recurrent neural network lstm to actually help us so we'll predict based on this what should be missing word predict based on this what should be missing word then we combine come up with a better prediction so um so the video encoder again we'll have temporal attention special attention um, and find these features so suppose you input video like this <coughs> so the sentence is someone watches out of the corner of his eye as the kid finds a cheap blank inside so the blank is a sweet so we will take the image and want to find out where is this suite, the particular region, attention, which means where is attention being paid when the sentence is said and get a score and you will find out that this is the region where the suite was there, which is interesting. <coughs> and we can do the same thing, which frame temporal attention is being done and these are frames where he's actually you know, doing the suites. So um, there's a very nice data set um, which um, deals with this problem and that's a movie data set. So, um, <clears throat> so let me skip this with a lot of details but let's look at uh, <clears throat> the actual results here. So this is the video and this is a sentence, it's one blank, one blank is missing. So this is a answer we get and this is a ground truth which is correct and this is the attention being paid and this is the temporal attention so these are the frames where this particular um, thing is happening um, so it's another example uh, I showed you before and this is the blank and this is a ground truth attention and this is the temporal attention uh, this is another sentence um, and this is sentence and then it's a blank missing so we can and these are the blank so it's very interesting that you are combining language and the vision and again the same thing because what you are doing doing the word to vector so it's again numbers and image is a number again so we can actually manipulate those Okay, so this was paper in ICCV and there's a YouTube presentation um, which is detailed about this here. 
So let's now look at the last piece, <clears throat> which is how we can read the mind. Okay. So this is a work we are doing with collaboration with a group in uh, Sicily, Italy, University of Catania. And this, we have two papers, one CVPR, one ICCV. So the idea is that, you know, so neural networks are inspired by the human brain and neurons. So we want to look at it that, um, you know, this conversion neural network, you know, immediate human uh, visual cortex and uh, but what are they missing? Okay. So when we do the object classification categorization, so that's looking at um, the perception, so visual cortex. But there is something else called the conception or cognitive process. And that depends on the prefrontal cortex. So we want to kind of harness these visual cognitive factors for visual categorization. So how we do it, we uh, record this EEG from the human brain and analyze these signals. Um, so, so they have collected this data set. There are six people They sit like this and these are the EEG sensors. And while they look at the screen, some particular class of object is shown. And there are 40 classes from ImageNet. ImageNet is a big data set with 1,000 classes, but they, we pick only 40 because it's a simpler problem. And they're shown for half a second on the screen. And then you record about 128 channels at 1,000 hertz and 16-bit resolution. So this data set is available. You can use that. So these are the 40 image net class categories. Okay. So the question we asked that can class discriminatory EEG features can be extracted from raw EEG signals, which means can we just use the <coughs> EEG feature to recognize these different classes instead of looking at the images. So. Um, so the idea is that uh, you know, this is the image, and these are the easy signals. Then we compute features using LSTM, and then it's mapped on different manifold, and we use the classifier softmax. And um, so it uh, works pretty well. So it looks at the pizza and give you pizza, and so on. So we are using only EEG feature, the brain signals. OK, so that is the first Piece. So now, in this one, because these are temporal um, signals, and they are 1D signals, so there are different ways to do, you know, use those using recurrent uh, neural network, as I talk about. Um, but we can get uh, the pretty good classification accuracy using these different. Um, versions of these, how, how many channels we use, they are 64, 128, and so on for this EG classification. So this is the first work that we are using 40 classes, and we get, you know, more than 80 percent, but in the past, you know, the number of classes have been very low, four classes, 12 classes, and the classification accuracy is very low, 28 percent, instead of 80 percent we are getting. So um, next thing we want to ask that can we, can EG features can be used for automated image classification? So what does it mean that um, we um, take the um, image and compute the image features and using the image features then we find the corresponding EG features to the regression. And based on the EG features, we want to classify. So which is, you know, pretty interesting. So because person looks at it and the image and get these um, EG signals and we compute features and then we say, well, can we recognize those? So um, since we have learned the mapping from the images to EG features, so we can do that. And we did it. Um, so, 
So, so here, the um, what is happening is uh, that the input is an image. Then we map it to at that time when we want to do classification, we don't have an EEG feature, but we take an image and find a corresponding EEG feature because we have learned this regression mapping. Then we can still classify and works pretty well. So now we learn this regression on the ImageNet, but we can actually classify another data set, Caltech, about 30 classes, and it works actually pretty good. And we can compare that if you use visual images, we get about 92% or so on. But if you use the corresponding EEG feature, we can come close to that, which is, which is pretty good. So which means the the EEG feature is computing some kind of very equivalent information about the visual visual features, which is good. Okay. So uh, next thing we we did the, the last thing I'm going to talk about, which is again a very interesting. So um, what we want to do here that um, the person looks at the image and we get EEG features. And using EEG feature, we want to synthesize the visual image, no? So, which is amazing thing, right? So that's why we call it reading the mind. And for that, we are using the gain generator adversary network. Remember, talk about as an artist fake want to fake the Picasso, and it becomes better and better. There's a discriminator which has access to the real Picasso. So it's like that because we have a pairs, we have the image and we have corresponding EEG feature using training, using a training. So we train that and we, you know, learn now we have the input EEG feature that we can generate the image. And it looks like, no, let me play the video. So it looks at the panda and this is a synthetic, it's a fake image, it's generating, you know, pizza and uh, and so on, which is which is you know really amazing. It's it's not very you know um, fine and high resolution, but it's pretty interesting. Okay, so as I said, you know we have a gain model, so we get the this encoding, and this is the generator and discriminator, and these are the details. I'm going to skip that. Um, so we can generate images like this. <clears throat> so these are the airliner, this is the pumpkin, and so on. I mean, these are, you know, have some problems, but still that these are the generated from the EEG signal, which is pretty impressive. So this paper was in ICCV and available there. Okay, so in summary, I talk about eight different papers, uh, semantic segmentation, Given an image, we want to assign a label to each pixel with a fine segmentation. Second problem was given a face image, we want to find attributes. There are 40 attributes. Third problem was given a query image, we want to re-identify that image in the gallery. Next problem was given a drone video, we want to detect different vehicles and lots of vehicles. Next one, we talk about that Given a video, we want to find where the anomaly happening. And uh, next one was that given a video, we want to recognize and localize an action. Um, then I talk about um, given a video and accompanying sentence where there's a one word missing, we want to fill in the blank. So it's combine the language and the vision together. And the last one was that how we can read the mind which means we are getting these EEG signals um, from the one-dimensional signal and then relating this to the visual information. So just to end, uh, you know, uh, I can kind of put side by side the classical computer vision because the second lecture was classic computer vision and this one is deep learning. Uh, <clears throat> so in classic computer vision, what we used to do, we will have handcrafted features. And we will encode expert knowledge into constraints. And then we'll take convert constraint objective function. 
and then optimize objective function. Um, but deep learning is motivated by human neural networks and there's real learning going on, which is the main main thing here. Um, because these handcrafted features, we as a human were able to, you know, come up with, not, we were not learning. <coughs> the other thing about deep learning is that it requires a lot of label data, annotated data. And it requires GPUs, massively parallel, because a lot of computation, as you saw, there are millions of these parameters, okay? Um, then, the in order to find these parameters, it's very simple that you can use a step, you know, stochastic gradient descent, which is a very simple method, but somehow it works because we have lots of examples and uh, we are doing many iterations and so on. Um, so that is um, one big difference. So this uh, ends part two. And so conclusion, deep learning has been disruptive to computer vision. <clears throat> and deep computer vision is being used in self-driving cars, robotics, healthcare, language, vision, sound and vision. And uh, the ultimate goal is artificial general intelligence that can you know, do most of the things. And so alpha go, uh, alpha zero, is towards that, you know, they can beat the champion in these very complicated games.